Hello and good afternoon. My name is Will Ritchie and I am the curator here at the National Botanic Garden of Wales. And this afternoon, I'll be introducing you to plant health practices routinely utilised here at our National Botanic Garden to help create a biosecure site. And hopefully, I can provide you with some easy, effective and low-cost tips. Now, most presentations I do, I start with this slide. And I think it's really helpful to define what we do and the purpose of our botanic garden. So a botanic garden is a documented collection of plants for the purpose of conservation, research, display and education. It is therefore our mission to be able to cultivate collections of plants and currently we cultivate over 8,000 different taxa to foster and develop those areas of study. And to do that, we have to work within a secure biodiverse environment. So in essence, we are a resource for contemporary scientific research, a refuge for plant diversity, a hub for engaging the public, and of course, a center for learning. And for each of those focuses, being biosecure is vitally important. It is the platform on which we can progress our mission and deliver tangible benefits to Wales and beyond. And being biosecure is incredibly serious for us. Our trustees hold a risk register and at level one is biosecurity because plant, animal and human biosecurity is vital to the success of our organization. During today's presentation, I will aim to provide you with an insight into our plant health practices and provide you with a step-by-step -step guide to the workflow and processes that we use. We don't have a large budget for plant health, so I feel these practices are accessible to all in horticulture, even if some may need to be improvised. The basis of all biosecure horticultural operations is knowledge and good plantsmanship, continuing to develop the knowledge of plant pathology, growth and development is the most important thing we can do as horticulturists. Having the knowledge is how we stay biosecure. A key concept for us is that of trusted or vetted suppliers. We like to know where our plants are coming from, whether we feel they are committed to plant health, ultimately, whether we can trust them to provide us with healthy plant materials. What that entails is developing a relationship with nurseries and developing an even closer relationship with the ones that we commonly use. This can be as simple as visiting the nursery, having a look around, reviewing the quality of their stock, also reviewing the quality of their stock over time as you receive it. Having a trusted suppliers list is our due diligence process. It ensures that our criteria for plant health standards are being met prior to purchase and prior to those plants being incorporated into our collections. We are an active participant in field work overseas and have a wide range of international partners. We therefore need to have a considered process for plant materials arriving from outside the European community. Currently, we only receive seeds from our national and international partners. But seeds are not without risk. They can still carry pests and diseases, but we feel the risk is manageable with the facilities that we currently have. For living plant materials, a process of quarantine is a statutory requirement. When quarantine for plant materials is required, we work with other quarantine centres throughout the UK to ensure the highest standards are met. These are typically 
our colleagues at the Royal Botanic Gardens Edinburgh and Kew. Now, as some of you may have already guessed, exchanging plants with other botanic gardens is really important for us. It is our primary means of developing our own collections and it's important that we're able to do so. We predominantly work within a network of botanic gardens. This network has high standards of plant health and we can be confident that these high standards are adhered to on both sides of the exchange. Botanic garden to botanic garden transfer of plant materials, however, does have known risks. So we take the same precautions that we would do if we were exchanging with a commercial nursery or even nurseries on our trusted suppliers list. Another potential source for plant materials arriving in a botanic garden, and maybe it happened more so in the past, is through donations from the public. Each week we receive many requests from members of the public who wish to donate their plants to the botanic garden. Very well-meaning and very kind, but we hardly ever accept these. A large proportion of these plants we find are actually from collections on holidays, probably without permissions or permits or particularly no documentation. So we can reject these plants on a number of criteria, but plant health is one of those key criteria too. If we can't be confident of the legitimacy or health status of plants offered, there is no benefit for us accepting such plants. There's no benefit of taking that risk. There may be an extremely rare instance if it has a conservation goal, if it has a genuine reason for accepting it, that we may do so, but it would have to be a very, very well supported case. Here at the Botanic Garden, we use a data management system called IRISBG to record our plant collections. This is a really important resource for our work and our plant health practice, as we are able to assign unique identifiers to each and every plant in our collection, trace their movements in and out of our garden. All documentation such as plant passports, phytosanitary certificates can be assigned to an individual record, an individual plant. With a quick scan of a barcode on a label, we can pull up all the required documentation that we need. The monitoring of plant health can also be recorded using the same system. We can look at chronological assessments of plant health. We can look to identify patterns within our plant collections. We can ask many, many questions of our data that can be very revealing for plant health purposes. Now, when plants arrive at the Botanic Garden, they are isolated before they fully enter the collection. They are assigned an accession number, but they are kept in a plant reception for a minimum of 12 weeks. The isolation period is designed to provide the time and space for inspections. It allows us to check for any physical evidence of pest and disease. It's a cooling off period, which allows us to just take the time to do the inspections that we need. Plants are inspected upon arrival. They may be inspected intermittently, but they'll also be inspected before they finish the isolation period and incorporated into collection. All these results are recorded on our Iris BG system. Once the isolation and inspection process is complete, plant materials can finally enter the collection, but there are occasionally other practices which we need to include in the process. If we can, we remove all the soil and all the growing medium from the plants and they are repotted. Physical cleaning too of the plants can often be overlooked, but it's an important step. And once these plants are included in our collection, once they are assimilated into the rest of the living collections and displays, 
we continue with our monitoring. And we can do this using our accession numbers, our data management system, and by tracking that data. Glasshouse cultivation of healthy plants is dependent on a number of different variables, such as the environment, the temperatures within your glasshouse, but there are some common considerations to think about. For me personally, airflow is critically important and often overlooked in your glasshouse. Designing how the air moves around, thinking about the circulation of air, can be one of the most important steps you can take. Consider, for example, the, the benefits you could have from just spacing out your plants in a different way, or using extractor fans to reduce the humidity within your space. Pathogens also thrive in wet, contiguous environments. So think about all those plants you have sitting on the floor, the, the wet floor beneath, the geotextiles, the wet soil, that is the perfect environment for pathogens to spread. It is therefore vital if you can to raise plants off the ground. And that could be a really simple solution such as using um, raised benches, for example. And if you're able to have that free draining environment, if you're able to break up that contiguous environment that pathogens can move around, you will improve plant health within your glass house. The movement of staff between glass houses can be another way that pathogens spread. And this is an area where we actually still need to improve. It wouldn't be in our interest to stop members of staff moving from glass house to glass house. That just isn't practical. But we need to be conscious of the risks and try and mitigate them where we can. A simple way to do this is just using foot baths. They are common on farms, particularly dairy operations, and now commonplace in horticulture too. In public gardens, we first became used to using such systems during the foot and mouth outbreak, but they are still relevant now. It's a really low cost solution to just reducing that spread of pathogens on people's feet. We also do things like limit tools to one particular glass house, and that just stops the spread from area to area. Our horticulturists regularly clean and disinfect their tools, but we needed to include additional measures to make sure we were limiting the spread. Now, in regards to pest management, we currently work with a company called Dragonfly, who are biological control specialists based in Essex. It was set up by Julian Ives, who has worked with Copert for many, many years and is now helping public gardens and horticulture operations to better manage their pests using natural methods. We currently have a program in place that aims to be proactive, not redressing existing problems, but designed to stop problems from arising in the first place. And it's working really well. We've been able to eliminate the use of synthetic pesticides in our nursery glass houses. We do use SB Invigorator, which is a great product that we can use in combination with our biological control, but it is using a physical mode of suppression. That doesn't mean that we don't target common pests, we do. We adjust our orders as needed and we can really tackle problems as they arise too. We use, for example, products called Aphis Scout and N-Strip in good quantities. And this currently tackles problems that we have with aphids and whitefly. Plant materials that we intend to use for planting in our outdoor garden areas are also held to the highest standards of plant health. Now with herbaceous material coming into the collection, it isn't always possible to remove the growing medium, but we do if it's feasible. Now, this is another area where we use our plant record system to great effect. We use our database to monitor plants after planting. We check on our plants at predetermined intervals, usually one to three months, depending on the growing season, to check if there's any pests or disease present. 
If we were to find a pest or disease in the garden, we remove it and dispose of the infected material. We can make horticultural judgment calls based on what we think the susceptibility of the plants around it is, and also if there's a possibility of other hosts being close by. We can remove those plant materials too to make sure that we isolate the problem. And once again, it is really important that our teams are cleaning and disinfecting our tools. We allocate tools to particular teams and they don't exchange them between teams. It's important in horticulture that you have as many stakeholders in plant health, not just one designated person. It simply doesn't work that way. We try to make sure all of our horticultures are invested in good plant health protocols. We ask horticulturists themselves to try and stay up to date with the latest information. And that includes keeping up with the Sentinel sites and Sentinel networks, and also the UK Plant Health Risk Register. So they are all aware of the current threats. As I mentioned earlier, a lot of our work involves conservation. So the risk of us releasing a pest or disease into a wild population while participating in those conservation and species recovery programs is a major concern for us. The possibility of doing more harm than good as a conservation organization is simply unthinkable. We therefore take extra precautions when preparing plants for reintroduction to the wild. Firstly, they are grown exclusively in isolation, never fully integrated into collections. Secondly, we conduct thorough cleaning and preparation steps to ensure the plant material is not contaminated. Now, since I've been at the garden, most of the work we've been doing has been with low risk species. But in the future, we may be working with other taxa and this, the risk of spreading pathogens could be much higher. And in those instances, we could use other techniques such as using PCR or pathogen baiting to check on those plants prior to dispatch. There is other techniques available to us if required. Now, when releasing plants, for research, conservation, and educational purposes, they all come with a data and information packet. No plant in our collection is of any utility without the associated plant records and documents too. Plant health requirements when sending material out is predominantly set by the receiving institution as they carry the greatest risk but we do try to instigate good practice on both sides of the exchange. If we can, if it's acceptable, we will isolate 12 weeks prior to the exchange, and that may lead to a 24 week isolation period. Now to some, that may seem overboard. However, with good planning, it can be a really simple process and it can utilize very little staff capacity too. It's all about the planning, all about planning your season out and making sure that you're able to create the time for good plant health practices. Before any plant leaves our collection, we ensure that it is inspected. We will never exchange plant materials that have physical manifestations of pests or diseases. We aim to be a biosecure site and we aim to not negatively affect any other plant collection in our work. Now we have come to the end of my presentation, but I do have a few takeaways for you. I'd like to summarize a few really important points. I think it is imperative that we as horticulturists exercise due diligence when acquiring plant materials. It is after all our responsibility to make sure the plants that we acquire are healthy plants. If you can, if you have the space and time, you should be isolating plants when you receive them or when you dispatch them. By creating this time for isolation, 
you're able to check and inspect those plants. You're able to see if any pests or diseases manifest themselves, things that you probably haven't had the time to see beforehand. So please do think about how you can isolate plant materials before the exchange. It's important that we're able to also create inhospitable environments for pathogens, thinking about the pathogen's ecology and breaking up those contiguous environments for them. Make sure that the environment between the water sources and the plants and between the plants themselves are as inhospitable to pathogens as they can possibly be. And finally, a really good tip is just to make time in your diary to review and audit your plant collections. Just look for those marginal gains you can make to try and make your growing environments and your horticultural practices that little bit better. And if we're all able to improve our plant health practices, we will make sure that horticulture is able to continue to thrive and go from strength to strength. Thank you for your time today. I've been Will Ritchie and hopefully see you all sometime soon.